You all may be seated. Hello all, and welcome to the Milo Grogan Recreation Center for the State of Our City Neighborhood Conversation on Shared Prosperity and Mobility. My name is Kamara Willoughby, and I am a student at The Ohio State University studying environmental economic development and sustainability with a focus in community development. I am also the vice chair of the Milo Grogan Area Commission and an employee of this wonderful recreation center. As a commissioner, my job is to have clear communications from the residents to the city to make sure the city is aware of our needs and to make sure that the residents of Milo Grogan know what is taking place in our community so that, we, so that we can prepare and participate in the changes that take place. Martin Luther King Jr. said, if you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, you have to keep moving forward. We all have a role to play, so it's important that we all act first as an individual, and then as a community, and as a city, we will prosper. We all work, whether it is tutoring children, helping at, our, at your local shelter, driving a bus, working at the office, or being an elder of your church. So we will all share in the success that comes after our hard work. Even then, our work will still not be over. Speaking of elder, I would like to introduce Elder Dale Tucker, Sr. of Tristone Missionary Baptist Church to the, provide the invocation. Again, welcome to Milo Grogan. Thank you. May we bow our heads. Most holy and all wise God, this is the day that you have made. And we are grateful and appreciative that you touched us with your finger of love and allowed our names to be on the wake up list. We thank you for this opportunity to come to dialogue and to discuss how each and every one of your sons and daughters may be able to prov be provided an opportunity for upward mobility and to share in the riches according to your glory. We pray now, God, for the leadership within the city. We ask a special prayer for our mayor and for all those that work alongside him to oversee this great city. We don't just ask for your blessing upon our city officials, but we ask that you will bless those in state government as well as federal. You said in your word to lean not unto thy own understanding, but in all thy ways acknowledge you and you would direct our paths. So tonight, on today, we acknowledge you. We ask God that you will provide guidance according to your wisdom for every decision that is made for every thought that is brought out. We ask that you will bless us and we will be blessed. Keep us and we will be kept. In the matchless name of Jesus we pray, amen.
Hi, my name is Zakai Shaw. I have lived in the Milo Grogan community for the past four years, and I've been a part of the Milo Grogan Boys and Girls Club for the past two years. The Boys and Girls Club is a safe place where I can hang out with my friends. Also, it allows me to be a positive role model for the younger members of the club. I am also a student at Walnut Ridge High School, where I will pursue an early graduation. Then in fall, I hope to attend Columbus State University, focusing on the nursing program. With the support, thank you. With the support of Milo Grogan, my family, and the Milo Grogan Boys and Girls Club, I hope to succeed, and I think I will have the tools needed to succeed. Now it is my pleasure to introduce you to our mayor, Mayor Andrew J. Genther. Thanks, everybody. What a great night to be in Milo Grogan. Thank you, Zakai. We're so proud of you and thrilled about the future you're going to build uh, here in Columbus. Good evening and welcome to our fifth and final 2018 State of Columbus Neighborhood Conversation. Thanks to the Air Force Junior ROTC from Columbus Downtown High School for the posting of the colors. Thanks to Kamara Willoughby for the great welcome to the Milo Grogan neighborhood. And thanks to Nathan Lapish, the great director here at the Milo Grogan Community Center. Elder, thank you for getting us started off the right way this evening. And I also like to thank Royce Carpenter, who's here tonight as our sign interpreter. I'd like to take a quick moment to thank all the elected officials that have joined us here tonight. From Columbus City Council, President Shannon Harden, President Pro Tem Stenziano, Council Members Elizabeth Brown, Mitch Brown, Jiza Page, Emmanuel Remy, and Council Member Priscilla Tyson. I'd also like to recognize our City Attorney, Zach Klein, and our City Auditor, Megan Kilgore. We also have our Franklin County Common Pleas Judge, Judge Terry Jamison, that's joined us. We appreciate all of you being here tonight. Now, the most dangerous part of the night, are there any elected officials that I've missed that have joined us here this evening? Uh, I'd like to thank my cabinet and staff for putting together a different approach to the usual State of the City address. Tonight, I would specifically like to thank Steve Shoney, our Director of Development, and Mike Stevens, our Chief Innovation Officer. And I'm going to thank each and every one of you that have joined us here tonight for the conversation and all of you joining us via live stream. In last year's State of the City Address, I laid out ambitious plans for us to have a tangible, long-lasting impact on the lives of all of our residents. We set clear goals to ensure that every person in every neighborhood is sharing in the success story that is Columbus. This was not a one-year agenda, but a multi-year plan. And this plan cannot be accomplished without our incredible community partners. We are here in Milo Grogan this evening for a reason. Because so much of our agenda for shared prosperity, an economy that works for everyone, is rooted in the work here in Milo. Affordable housing workforce development, and mobility. They all come together right here in this neighborhood. Homeport is one of our partners in affordable housing. They build quality, affordable homes, primarily through private investment. They understand that providing a roof over someone's head isn't just alone enough. Homeport surrounds its residents with comprehensive support to promote long-term stability and health. You'll hear from Leah Evans from Hopeport, who's here tonight and will be on our panel. But right now, I'd like to tell you a story about another extraordinary neighbor of ours, Sherry White. Sherry is a longtime resident of Milo Grogan, 
She moved here from the west side and has been a Homeport resident for six years. Through the lease option program, Sherry was able to purchase her very first home just last December. She is thrilled to be a homeowner and credits Homeport for making the process easy and accessible. Sherry, if you're here, will you please stand? We are grateful for Sherry and all that she does in making this an example of a great partnership with Homeport, the city, and so many other partners. I'd also like to tell you about Rogue Fitness. Its owner, Bill Henninger, operates his CrossFit equipment manufacturing business right here in Milo Grogan. I got a personal tour not too long ago. His mission is simple. Keep manufacturing in the United States and hiring skilled workers, resulting in higher quality products and more economic growth within the local community. He also looks at the reverse. Without a factory, workers wind up unemployed. At his 6,000 square foot facility, Bill employs more than 300 people. Bill, will you please stand? Thank you for being a part of the fabric of the neighborhood. Both Sherry's house and Bill's business are close to Cleveland Avenue, the main thoroughfare here in Milo. We think there's great potential for this corridor to become an incredible opportunity corridor in the future. The other key to growth in this neighborhood involves transportation. And this is where CODA stepped up big time. In a few minutes, you'll hear from Laura Kaprowski from CODA, who's also part of our panel. But let's talk a little bit about CMAX. I believe that mobility is the great equalizer of the 21st century. When you think about it, regardless of where you live in this community, if you have access to jobs, higher education, affordable, high-quality childcare for your children, health care, everything that we take for granted, fresh fruits and vegetables, think of the possibilities. CMAX, CODA's first bus rapid transit line, is a critical component of that here in Columbus. CMAX connects residents along Cleveland Avenue between downtown and Polaris. The route links more than two 100,000 residents to jobs, health care, and educational resources. It also encourages economic growth opportunities all along the corridor, like the Huntington Gateway that we celebrated opening just last year. Columbus is in a very special time in our history. We have realized unprecedented growth, and we have much to be proud of. You saw in the video, earlier some of the highlights just from last year. Businesses, expansions added more than 1,300 jobs and $191 million in new payroll. Two million square feet of additional office space in the Far East, South Side, and Franklinton. $600,000 in business revitalization grants and small business loans. And as you may have heard, we're a finalist for Amazon's second headquarters. Some in the national press are surprised. We are not. We compete for great projects like Amazon every day in this city. And it's because of our public-private partnership and work as a region that we're poised to compete and win on a national and international level. And we're grateful for the our outstanding development team, and our partners at Columbus 2020. Growing jobs is critical. 80%, 80% of the city's revenue for basic city services comes from income tax. Our job market and its strength right now is what allows us to hire more police officers, build new fire stations like the one being designed right now on the Far East Side, and continue to invest and improve great neighborhood centers like this one. And as we grow and add more jobs, 
I am committed to make sure this success reaches into all corners of our community. So in 2016, I asked the city's Department of Development to commission a first ever, the first time we've ever done this as a city, to study to better understand the use of incentives. Incentives are public resources. And as we grow, we need to make sure we're leveraging those incentives for the public good. We need them to work with us to expand affordable, mixed-use housing development throughout our community. Based on the research and input from residents and developers, we announced policies in January that will benefit neighborhoods and residents by spurring development of affordable housing and living wages, real and long-lasting change for the people of Columbus. Let me give you an overview of some of these proposed changes. We're gonna prioritize neighborhoods based on the greatest opportunities for development. We're gonna leverage the largest and strongest of our incentives for neighborhoods that need our greatest focus for private investment to make public-private partnerships work for the residents of those neighborhoods. And through a variety of regulations, we will also require that companies that want to build in market-ready neighborhoods, those booming neighborhoods, that they also build a certain amount of affordable housing. We want our seniors to be able to age in place, and we want cops and firefighters and teachers to live in some of these thriving neighborhoods as well. We know that incentives work as a tool to spur equal growth through the city instead of concentrating projects in already thriving areas. And we've seen success of the revitalization efforts that we've done together. The South Side, the Near East Side, and in Wineland Park. We all know that there are many different pathways to the middle class. And in order for us to achieve my vision, to make Columbus America's opportunity city, where we have the largest middle class of any city our size in the country, and a place you're more likely to go from poverty to the middle class and beyond than anywhere else, we have to make sure that we identify, open, and expand diverse career pathways. Local colleges and universities are doing an excellent job with this work. Important partners like Columbus State and Ohio State are helping teachers in early childhood education jobs prepare for higher paying jobs. And last week, Cameron Mitchell and Columbus State announced an incredible and ambitious public-private partnership to make its hospitality and culinary arts program into one of the best in the country, starting with a new building in this opportunity corridor on Cleveland Avenue. Tonight, I'd like to announce the formation of a task force to explore a career pipeline into the hospitality industry, a joint effort between Experience Columbus and the Workforce Development Board. I charge this group to create opportunities for people to move from entry-level positions into higher paying jobs in the industry. But we also know that all paths to the middle class and beyond do not require two or four year degrees. The construction trades are booming right now. 73% of Ohio construction companies are having trouble finding qualified workers. These are good paying jobs and opportunities for careers. Late last year, we signed the Community Benefits Agreement covering the construction of Fire Station 35 on the Far East Side. It establishes enhanced cooperation between workers and the city that eliminates the possibilities of labor disputes and includes provisions to increase apprenticeship opportunities in the construction trade and recruitment plans geared toward minorities, women, and low-income residents. One of the best tools we have in workforce development is summer youth employment. In a few minutes, you'll hear from Lisa Pat McDaniel of the Workforce Development Board but I want to take the opportunity right now to challenge all of our business owners and leaders in the room and that may be watching to become involved in our summer youth employment effort. 
Having a summer job not only gives our youth the ability to make a little money, it exposes them to career paths and teaches them the soft skills needed to be successful in the workplace. Finally, I'm gonna talk briefly about Smart Columbus, our cornerstone to the future of mobility in Columbus. This has never been about making it easier to get from point A to point B, but to opening up ladders of opportunity for people throughout our community. An incredible amount of hard work has been focused on detailing how we're going to deliver the projects that were conceived during the Smart Cities Challenge. The implementation details are guided by the community input that we have received. The community, for example, is interested in how we utilize technology and transportation providers to solve the first and last mile challenge that so many of our residents face. This entire effort, this entire effort is Columbus's place to help answer, I think, the greatest challenge and opportunity of the 21st century. How do we leverage innovation and technology to help people improve their own lives? This is about moving our residents to opportunities of the future. So we're starting to see projects implemented that are helping to make us a smarter city. We've talked about CODA CMAX, 93 electric vehicles added to the city of Columbus fleet, the launch of Smart Columbus's operating system, our open data platform that we are targeting to be live this May during Startup Week. We need partners in all of this important work. And tonight, you'll hear from people and organizations who are helping us reach our goals. Before I introduce our panelists, let me tell you how this evening will work. For the next 30 minutes or so, I'm gonna ask the panel some questions and then it's your turn. You should all have a card on your seat if you have a question, please fill out that card and get it to one of our staff members. We're gonna to try to gather those questions and get to as many of them as we can as time allows. And if you're watching from home, please post your question online. We will likely not get to every question. We haven't yet, but we'll try tonight. But if you do include your contact information, my team will get back to you. Now, let me introduce our panel for this evening. Alex Bendar, CEO of Columbus Idea Foundry. Leah Evans, Vice President of Neighborhood Strategies at Homeport. Laura Kaprowski, Vice President of Government Relations at CODA. Jordan Miller, Area President of Fifth Third Bank. And Lisa Pat McDaniel, President and CEO of the Workforce Development Board. Please welcome our panel. Thank you all for joining us tonight and being part of this. We appreciate it. Alex, I'll pick on you first. <laughs> Please. Um, how do you define shared prosperity, uh, you know, and the work of the Idea Foundry, how that plays into shared prosperity for this community? Yeah, I, I love this question. And uh, before I start, too, I started the Idea Foundry in Milo Grogan about 10 years back, and before then, I had an art studio at the Milo Arts Complex, so it's nice to be back in the neighborhood. Um, but uh, I think I'm definitely one of the people who believes that a, a rising tide lifts all ships, and what's good for my neighbor is good for me. And when I learned about 10 years ago um, what I call the democratization of opportunity, and that's essentially a a large phrase that means if you have a smartphone that can stream YouTube, you can learn anything now. Uh, yes, go to college. Yes, do that too if, if that's your, your interest. But walls have fallen in the last few years about how to learn something uh, from making a mobile app to making a, a wooden table. Uh, and one of the bottlenecks is just access to these tools to learn how to use them access to a friendly and talented community to show you how they work, and a clubhouse to call your own, a lot like this one. Uh, and that's what the Idea Foundry is. And uh, just as you said, as the jobs market in Columbus grows, you can provide more services. As we succeed more, we can provide more services to our members, more tools, more programming. And in fact, we see within our membership 
many of whom are startups, uh, whether they're artisans or craftspeople or technologists, uh, they wind up hiring some of our own members to do work for them as well. So we see this little ecosystem where we're all sharing in prosperity. And I might define prosperity not just as having enough to eat, being able to afford your rent, but if you can find a passion too, and if you can get paid to do your passion, then you've really won at life. And that's what we really try to help people do, explore dozens of things, whether you want to go into the trades, whether you want to go into software boot camp, uh, test it out briefly and quickly at our space, and then take a deeper plunge. So I define shared prosperity as finding something you love, doing well at it, and then helping your, your neighbors as well. Leah, finding a, a path to shared prosperity is arguably one of uh, America's greatest uh, economic, political, and social challenges. And Columbus uh, is, is no, uh, you know, exception from that. Uh, there are, you know, many studies that talk about the economic segregation uh, that takes place in our community, great cities around the country. So talk a little bit about what housing, the housing community's role in particular in ensuring that every person in every neighborhood uh, has the opportunity to prosper. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you for the invitation to be here. I'd like to acknowledge quickly our President and CEO, Bruce Luthi. Thank you for the opportunity to be here speaking on behalf of Homeport and our residents. As we look at housing, housing is a foundational building block to security. If you do not have a safe place to lay your head, it is very hard for you to go to work, for you to learn, for you to prosper in any other area of your life. So that shared prosperity starts with those foundational building blocks of a safe place to live, access to transportation, access to jobs. But again, it all goes away if you have worries constantly about staying in your home, if you have worries constantly about how you're gonna make your rent or make your mortgage. We found that during the foreclosure crisis. This isn't just about our low income or low moderate income families. This is if those worries are persistent, then you're not gonna be successful in other areas of your life. So for us in the housing field, we're really looking at how do we created a continuum of housing that will address the spectrum of needs that people have. Not everybody is going to live in a single family detached house. There are multifamily opportunities. There are shelter opportunities and transitional opportunities for people. And then there's long term housing if we even talk about our seniors having the same concerns and the same worries. So building that continuum that addresses everyone's need where they're at is our role in the housing community. Particularly housing for us at Home Board is focused on that middle income person, that low and moderate income family that makes under 60% of the area median income. Those are the people working in the, in the stores and at the movie theater and at the bank. Um, so we particularly house them, but I, what we need to do as a housing community is address all of that spectrum of need so that everyone can be lifted up to Alex's point about that tide. Well, if you don't have a place to anchor yourself, you're not going to be left behind and you're going to get washed out by that tide. Well, and it shows, I think, you know, reinforces why the incentive study was so important uh, to build the case, as well as the Affordable Housing Alliance and others that have documented the great need for, for affordability out there. Um, you know, I think we're about 54,000 units short or thereabout of affordable housing in Franklin County and a critical part to our future if we want to avoid uh, this, this gap widening over the next 20 or 30 years. Uh, Laura and I had a chance to talk in the in the green room. That sounds very fancy, but it's just. <laughs> um, but we had a chance to talk. But we had a chance to talk about some of our peer communities that did not have the chance to get in front of these needs, like the Austins and Denvers and yeah. San Franciscos of the world. That where they got behind it, it was too late. And so now they're trying to play catch up and build funds and build housing. And the market is, has exploded to the point where the costs are so insurmountable in some ways. And so for us to be proactive in this in our incentive study and putting that forward as a community priority is really how we're going to protect against some of the the pressures and the fissures that other cities have felt as we continue to grow thank you um, Laura I talked a little bit about it but help kind of paint the picture and connect the dots for folks who are still trying to understand uh, the connection between mobility and prosperity and how important mobility is to accessing those ladders of opportunity. Oh, sure, thank you, Mayor. And um, 
Just really glad to be here today and with so many transportation partners joining us um, for tonight's event. Um, it's just really fantastic to see. So first, I mean, who is CODA today in 2018? We're actually the second largest transit authority in Ohio, right behind Cleveland. We provide over 65,000 trips for individuals every single day. That ends up being over 18 million trips throughout the year. And with CODA, you know, when you say workforce, CODA's there. When you say development, CODA's there. When you say housing, code is there. So we're much more than just about a bus company. And um, national studies have shown if you're going to invest in your public transportation just one dollar, you're going to see a four dollar return on investment. But things like affordable housing, transportation, go they do go hand in hand. I think also what's interesting to be here in Milo Grogan is that CODA is a large employer in our community and right here in this neighborhood. Just up the road, we have our Fields Avenue campus in this neighborhood. We dedicated $44 million um, to that area so that we could have state-of-the-art mobility services a, um, along with that bus facility as well. And we're providing hundreds of jobs to our community. If you go up the road um, further to the Linden neighborhood, you're going to see our Linden Transit Center. It's award-winning, close to $3 million investment, and very innovative. We decided to play the role as a um, kind of as a developer, as a property owner. And today our transit center is fully leased and occupied by a daycare center and a nationwide children's primary care office. So we are provide, able to help and be a part of providing services for working parents. And finally, you know, our service. It's about partnerships and it is absolutely if mobility and, and shared prosperity. It's about getting people to jobs. And sometimes CODA can get people from point A to point B. But sometimes we need to have partners. And in the case of getting Columbus residents to good jobs in the Rickenbacker area, we teamed up with our suburban um, neighbors and with them as a partner to create the great service. So CODA's able to get um, the workers down to the Rickenbacker area and then the great service is basically a shuttle that picks them up and can take them door to door to important jobs and new opportunities. So Jordan, uh, you know, is, is one of the leaders of Fifth Third and a native of, of Milo Grogan, grew up here, um, right here in this neighborhood. Talk a little bit about uh, some of the key in, ingredients that you see out there in the economic prosperity question and maybe some of the ways that Fifth Third is engaged and involved in, in helping us realize shared prosperity in this community. Thank, thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, like the Mayor said, I'm a resident of Milo Grogan. Matter of fact, um, <clears throat> I think I lived on this very same spot almost before our house was torn down and and we moved to build this great center. But um, growing up in this neighborhood and, and then coming back here today in, in a capacity as president of the bank, you know, bring, it really brings me a lot of pride. Uh, when my father moved here um, from West Virginia and bought the first house here, he had $3,000 and he was gonna buy an $8,000 house and no bank in town would lend him the money to buy that house. Uh, fortunately, he had co-signers to the loan and he was able to get a house and, uh, this, this neighborhood was great, and it, it provided a lot for me, so I'm, I'm happy to be here today uh, in the capacity at Fifth Third Bank. Uh, so at the bank, here's how we think of, of economic prosperity. One is financial stability. You know, being self-sufficient, uh, being able to provide for your family, to live in a nice neighborhood where there's access to meaningful work and jobs, uh, to have the ability to, uh, to get your kid, children ready to do the things that you would want them to do and the family to live the way you would want them to live. One of the ways we, we, we have multiple ways we do this at the bank, but one of the things that I'm really proud of is our Community Development Corporation, uh, which assists uh, nonprofit organizations in low and moderate income housing. So uh, projects that we work on in conjunction uh, <clears throat> with, with the home ports of the world, with the habitat uh, uh, habitats of the world that, that actually do the house and we can do the lending. Um, 
to make uh, housing affordable, to make uh, homes affordable to families. Uh, we provide a lot of grants in on some of the neighborhoods that are doing a lot of work. So here in this neighborhood, as well as in uh, like near East Side, we're, we're providing financing for folks that live there that, that, that need to fix up exterior on their homes. So we've got grants that, that people can apply for to, uh, to uh, fix the exterior. If they need a new roof, if they need new windows, they need siding or whatever it is, um, you know, that's one of the ways that we work. Another, another area that we uh, work a lot and do a lot in is small business. So one of our great partners is here on the east side of town is ECDI. Uh, we're a big investor in their fund. I think we put $2 million into their fund so they can help small businesses incubate help small businesses get off the road and help entrepreneurs uh, fulfill their dream and their passion uh, to, uh, to become entrepreneurs and to uh, provide services to a neighborhood. The, the final area that we really work hard on, and we've got a number of programs, and it's around education. So you can imagine, uh, if you want to be economically prosperous, you have to have some basic foundation of, of education. So information about your credit score. You know, how to improve your financial situation. You know, we've got programs that start off at the fifth grade level, our Young Bankers Club, which we, we do over a 10 state area, but we are very, very focused in this, in, in this area. Uh, in Columbus, we have volunteers that go into the schools that help children in the fifth grade learn basic financial information. We have a program for our high schools as well. So today, the requirement for high school, how high, high school graduate is they have to have a financial literacy, some level of financial literacy in order to graduate. We provide that information. We just upgraded our program and we're using a, a, an electronic based program that students have access to so they can fulfill that requirement. We have a number of home education and home buyer programs to get people prepared for home ownership. And we do this in conjunction with great partners like Homeport. Lisa, uh, you know, a lot of folks might not know what the Workforce Development Board does and the connection with Ohio means job uh, for Columbus and Franklin County. So talk a little bit about the board's role and work uh, in helping us realize shared prosperity. Absolutely. First of all, thank you too for including me on this panel. I'm very excited uh, because Milo Grogan is the first place-based initiative that we have done as the Workforce Board since I came on board about over a year ago. So I've had the great opportunity to be here in Milo and I've, um, we're doing some partnering with CareSource and doing some great things and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But so the Workforce Board is made up of primarily private sector uh, people, but also community and education partners. And what we do is we strategize with the resources that we have as to how we can help the city of Columbus residents and Franklin County find the jobs that they need to find. So essentially, we help job seekers get the skills and credentials that they need so that they can get jobs, not just jobs actually, careers that will bring them family sustaining wages over the long haul. And we help employers identify the talent pipelines with those job seekers that will help them prosper as well in the central Ohio economy. So that's primarily what we do. Today, I actually looked on uh, the job site. There are 33,000 jobs available today here in the city of Columbus in a 20 mile region outside of Columbus. 33,000 jobs. Of those, 12,000 of those jobs pay between $50,000 and $79,000. So, 4,000 of those jobs do not require anything more than a high school degree. What we want to do is we want to help people get what they need to get those jobs. Because my partner's up here, we absolutely, to maintain your housing, you do need housing and that needs to be the platform. But to maintain that housing, to be able to uh, do what you need to do in the community, you need to have a family sustaining wage, a job that pays that. And really, that's what we are all about in everything that we do. The Ohio Means Job Center 
And I actually have our job center operator, Scott Johnson, over here. Just wave your hand, Scott. <laughs> and uh, the job center is where anybody in this room can come in any day, five days a week, to try and to, to assess what your skills are, to understand what jobs are available to you. Uh, nursing is a particularly good one for the young man who stood up here and said that's where he wants to go. That's a very in-demand job here right now. And we will help you get those skills and those credentials. And in some cases, if you qualify, we'll actually help pay for that training. We also work with employers to do on-the-job training. So if they find a candidate and you're just missing something that you need for that job, we'll actually help that employer by paying some of the wages while they skill that person up and make that person the perfect fit. So we will do that at our job center. We are looking for all our community partners. We partner with them every day to uh, find people who need our assistance. And um, we are becoming very successful in that. We are performance driven. So uh, our performance measures are up on the state website for everybody to see. So you can see whether we're successful or not. And uh, right now, uh, well, our goal is to be exceed every measure that we have and we are well on our way towards doing that. So that's a little bit about us. Uh, thanks, Lisa. And I wanna come back to a question, uh, but I wanna go to talk to Leah about uh, another issue. But you mentioned the 33,000 jobs that are available right now. Yes. Uh, but there's another staggering statistic uh, that almost is equal to that, and that is the number of people that have been looking for work 12 months or longer. Right. Uh, so I, I wanna come back to you and talk a little bit about what are those barriers? What's the, where's that disconnect? If we have that many jobs available, but this many folks that have been looking for 12 months or longer, you know, walking through that a little bit. But before we do that, Leah, I wanna talk a little bit about the, the connection between geography and prosperity. Uh, walk, walk us through that and, and what that means. So I think there, there, there's a general conversation about where you live has a lot of determinants for your future. So whether that's your health, whether that's your educational attainment, whether that's wealth attainment, where you live and your zip code can limit what your options are going forward in life. And so I think our commitment at Homeport, and it echoes the mayor's commitment about prosperity and ladders, is really about you don't have to leave your neighborhood to live in a better one. So what are the things that you can do, that we can do as a, as a partner, that we can bring other partners to the table to do to improve the neighborhood and to improve those outcomes as it relates to geography and that not be a limiting factor. Um, a lot of conversation in housing, and I'm probably contradicting all of my other uh, peers, but a lot of conversation in this housing is about moving people to areas of opportunity. Why can't we create areas of opportunity wherever anyone is? And I think that's our commitment and that's the work that we have to do. And part of the work that we've been committed to at Homeport is not just to build a house, as the mayor said, it's to build strong communities and build areas and communities where people can prosper, whether that's because they're connected to jobs, whether that's because they're connected to childcare services so they can go to work, whether that's because they've gotten service coordination around another need they may have, whether that's emergency eviction prevention, Money, or whether that's food assistance, or whether that's um, material, the material assistance program. We've been connecting people to resources. If you're working and striving and driving every day, you don't really have time to call around to 15 different phone numbers to figure out where you can get some help. And so our commitment is that that geography not be a limitation and that we can be able to be that connector for people in their community. Um, Fortunately, it's for the Homeport residents, so, you know, um, how do we expand that beyond Homeport residents, but also other partners like us that do that same work so that there is coordinated effort around the services that do exist and connecting people to them so that people don't feel like they have to leave their neighborhood to then be in a better situation. I'll ask uh, Jordan as the only private sector employer up here. Uh, so I mentioned a little bit of this disconnect between jobs available and folks that have been, uh, you know, looking that uh, maybe are the more difficult to employ, whether it's a skill level issue, whether uh, uh, it's a drug testing issue, whether or not they are a restored citizen. 
talk about it from the private sector's perspective before we go back to Lisa to talk about how we're trying to connect that disconnect. Are there other challenges you see out yeah. there for folks? Yeah, I've got the, um, you know, Mayor, I've got the opportunity to work with a lot of businesses around town. So, you know, as a large commercial bank in, in this footprint, I talk to employers every day. I talk to companies every single day. Uh, we bank a, a number of middle market companies uh, right here in, in communities throughout our footprint. And when we talk, they talk about their need for talent. I mean, that's the number one priority that most of our businesses are facing is a need for talent. So it seems to be this disconnect. We have all these people and they have all these jobs, but we can't get them matched up. In certain cases, people don't pass a drug test. So we, we do see that a lot. Unfortunately, we've got a big opioid crisis out mm -hmm. there and mm -hmm. it's impacting not just our community, but every community throughout our country. So employers are, are, are challenged in that respect. I've had some employers even tell me that they're going to stop giving the drug test really? and, 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 and face a liability. To, the, the challenge with that is the other workers on the job know who the drug users are and they don't want to work with them. So uh, that, that's a huge problem. Finding the right skills and getting the right match. I mean, today's jobs, uh, the pace of change in job work is so different today than it was when I grew up. And when I grew up, there was Timken roller bearing right there where Rogue is. Mm -hmm. So you didn't have to have any skills. You didn't have to have a high school education. You could drop out in the fourth grade. If you were weighed over 150 pounds, you could go there and pretty much get a job if you were 16 years old or older. And uh, you could find a, a, a job working in a factory with no skills whatsoever. Those jobs don't exist anymore. So the, the thought that those jobs will ever come back to America or ever come back to our community, pretty much gone. I mean, people need to be trained. And, uh, but they don't necessarily need a college education. We forced a lot of folks into that. Uh, but business owners, they're looking for responsible people. They're looking for people that will show up on time, come to work, be open to learning skills. And, and, uh, and, and I think we've got a community here where we've got good access from transportation to get to those jobs. But I think that's, those are the things I hear when I talk to employers, Mayor. So Lisa, how do we, uh, how do we solve that? fix this disconnect? Uh, you know, a, a city community that's going to continue to thrive, I think, uh, we're expected to grow by another third as a region over the next 30 years, but the, we still have this disconnect with folks that are looking for work that are harder to uh, place and employ and the huge job opportunities out there. Well, number one, um, we all have to have the mindset, including our employers, that everybody who can work needs to work. And so that means a lot of things on the, on the employer side, and I know this isn't exactly what you're asking me first, but I want to get this out, mm -hmm. that, you know, people who may have been incarcerated at one point in time, they shouldn't have to walk with their sin forever before them. These are people who can bring skills, can be very good and loyal employees. People who may have a disability doesn't mean their brain doesn't work, doesn't mean they can't sit at a computer. Um, you know, people who, um, you know, drug addiction and opi opioids, that, that is a, something that we really have to come together as a community to solve because we are killing our future if we don't solve that problem. But I, I have had employers say to me that they're not going to drug test anymore. And, you know, I mean, that's fine, but we need, we need to uh, solve that problem. So we, uh, you know, back to your question, though. Um, let me tell you, so I also did pulled a little report today. I love data because it tells us a lot about our community. The top five employers in the month of January who posted jobs, of the top six, four of them were all health care providers. Hmm. Thousands of jobs by Mount Carmel, Ohio Health, Nationwide Children's, so we definitely have a mismatch. <laughs> we have um, people who may have had one type of job or career, and maybe that is not the job or career going forward. And so people have to expand. Uh, they have to be lifelong learners. I think, um, you know, again, coming to the job center and understanding what the labor market is, what jobs are available, and what kind of credentials you have to have so that we can help you identify what you would be interested in 
what skills you would need to have and help you to get those skills. Um, we, we just have an incredible skills mismatch. But there are, there are resources to get those credentials. One of the problems we have is we have many people who may be working, for example, in healthcare, as an example. We have all these jobs, but I tell you, registered nurses was the number one job posted in the month of January. We have people who are working in healthcare at the very low wage jobs, and they may be making, they may be working two or three positions, but they don't have the credentials to move through. Mm -hmm and move through that career path to the jobs that pay much better. And so what we're trying to do at the Workforce Board, the strategy the board has given me, is how do we get to those people and train them and provide them with credentialing when they're working two to three jobs? And that's what uh, we are working very hard to figure out. How do we get to those people? And they don't necessarily have to come to the job center. We need to figure out how to go to them. And so we're going to train be them while they're working. Right, yeah. right, right. Train them where they are. Maybe work uh, with employers to provide training during the work period, because um, you know there's only so many hours in a day, as you all know. And, but that is something we have really got to put a lot of energy behind trying to figure out, and we are. Any other uh, questions? If you uh, have any, if you can get those cards to staff that are walking around. We're going to start taking those in just a minute or two. Uh, but I want to get to entrepreneurship. Um, I continue to hear from folks around the country in our great entrepreneurial community here. You run an innovation maker space. Um, and I continue to hear from folks here that there is great growth potential for this community in particular if we focus and align and invest strategically around entrepreneurship. Lifting it up, celebrating it, investing it, supporting it. Talk a little bit about your, your vision and how Columbus can go to the next level around entrepreneurship because those are the folks creating uh, companies and businesses of today are gonna employ hundreds and thousands of people throughout Columbus, uh, including this neighborhood and other neighborhoods. So how do we support that? Sure. Um... So as a little bit of background, I'm not sure everyone knows exactly what we do with the Idea Foundry. We have tools from 3D printers to blacksmithing. We teach theory light, practice heavy classes on all of our tools. So learn how to weld in an evening or learn woodworking in an afternoon or learn computer programming in a, in a month or two. Uh, and then we sell memberships. So like a gym, uh, you come and work out, but instead of uh, getting stronger, you're exercising your mind and uh, exercising your creativity. We have maybe 500 members and growing quickly. Uh, about a third of those members self-identify as entrepreneurs or people who want to quit their day job and become an entrepreneur within the next year or so. So we're kind of a test bed where people can try out new skills, explore their passions, see if they have any aptitude at all for any of those things, uh, and then take the plunge and become an entrepreneur. And Casey McCarty is our chief operating officer. She loves to describe entrepreneurship as a recession-proof skill set. You're always able, you've taught yourself how to fish, uh, and you can always make your own, uh, make your own bread, as it were. Um, but I think we have, almost accidentally created a school where the answer to every question is Google it, uh, with the presumption that information is out there, you can always teach yourself something new, uh, and by having a community of hundreds of people who are artisans, web programmers, business people, website designers, and marketing folks, it's a, a virtuous cycle of self-supporting people. So you have workout partners, just like you do at a gym, but they'll help you make your website, they'll help you make your business plan, uh, and I think that is an ecosystem that we've worked hard to intentionally put together uh, and why I think this can really succeed in Columbus. Uh, now that we've gotten all these people under one roof, uh, we participated in a number of international competitions a few years ago on making stuff. Uh, 3D printing, electronics, robotics. About 300 cities competed from New York to San Francisco, uh, London to Singapore. Completely for giggles, we tossed our hat in the ring just to have fun competing. And nobody was more surprised than I was when we came in first in the world for 3D printing, first in the world for electronics and programming. Uh, our high school robotics team came in first in the world out of 3,000 schools around the world. Uh, so there's a heck of a lot of talent in this town. 
And if you put all those people in one place, allow them to rub shoulders and have these creative collisions, you give your community the chance to be greater than the sum of their parts. And, uh, and I think that uh, entrepreneurship is an excellent vehicle for that. So how does the rest of the community, you know, specifically, you're talking about innovation, what can non-scientists and engineers contribute uh, to supporting that culture of innovation and entrepreneurship? And then what, what can policymakers, uh, private sector leaders, and residents do to build a thriving culture for entrepreneurship in Columbus? Well, I know uh, Lisa mentioned data earlier, and I'm a big data-driven person myself, and I was surprised to learn, if you look at who's making stuff, um, scientists and engineers, and I'm, I'm one of those people, and we'll add entrepreneurs also, are good at solving technical problems. And in fact, they enjoy it. But that's not the heart of innovation. The challenge is finding the problem in the first place. Uh, and innovation doesn't come from someone with their hands uh, behind their head and their feet up on the desk, brainstorming about the next thing. Innovation comes from people who are doing work uh, and encountering a problem. Uh, that's nurses in the operating room, that's mothers at home, uh, that's uh, fathers at home, that's uh, really anyone who's got problems. Don't just think that's life as usual. If you find an issue, be empowered to innovate around that. And what we really strive is to teach people you're all empowered innovators. And you can say, well, you know, people, not everyone is a scientist, engineer, what have you. Um, I don't think you have to be. Uh, we're all born creative. Uh, and there's a great exercise you can do if you draw a circle and ask adults in a room, what is that? Most people will say that's a circle. If you ask five-year-old children, uh, they might say, oh, it's a ball, or it's the moon, uh, or it's cake. You know, we're born creative, it's always cake. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> so the trick is to keep people creative and playful and innovative. Uh, and I think the way that policy can work is by putting together neighborhoods where uh, the schools work with the maker space, work with the Parks and Rec Center, work with the housing, uh, work with the bars, coffee shops, and restaurants, and you have uh, these ecosystems in each neighborhood. And I love the idea of living, uh, improving your neighborhood in place. You don't have to leave to live in a better space. And we call these innovation neighborhoods, and, and we love the example that we're, we're striving to set in, uh, in East Franklinton. So Leah, how do we create those innovation neighborhoods? Particularly, uh, what are some of the non-real estate ways uh, to help support, you know, asset building uh, for low and, and moderate income families. I think Alex was really just expanding upon this idea of collaboration. And I've heard you talk, Mayor, many times about the Columbus Way and how we really do invest, it's like, stone soup where everybody brings what they have you've heard that old song you know, that old story um, my daughter just made had that whole story at school so but it's like the idea that everybody brings what they have so that we all can have more uh, Henry Ford said if everyone is moving forward together then success will take care of itself and so all of the pieces and parts that we have at this table all the pieces and parts that are represented in this room are a part of that it's again we can build a house we can build, uh, build 54,000 houses. Is that really going to move our neighborhoods and our communities and our people forward? Or is it the connections and the collaborations um, for individual families? One of the things that we learned early on at Home Poor, we've been doing this for 30 years, um, but early on we made a commitment to education, financial literacy, financial education, home buyer education, as Jordan referenced, as an opportunity for people to make investments in themselves that would allow them and their families to maintain wealth, grow the wealth they have, maintain the number one asset that most families grow from is home ownership. Mm -hmm. But we have to acknowledge that we live in 2018. Our home ownership rate may never get back to the 65% or 67% or this higher number in our country. We may settle at a base of 60%. So what does that mean? That means that we have a certain amount of people that are going to have their home as a major asset, but we have a whole community of people that that won't be their major asset. So what are those other ways whether that's through business development, whether that's through other ways that they are building wealth in their homes and as individuals through moving up at work, that's a major hurdle and a major barrier. Um, but we also have learned that just the, the, the mere going through a credit and budget counseling class can help persons understand better what they have and how they're spending it and make better choices that then will help them to go further. So I think that investment in, this, in the network and in the collaborations outside of 
the real estate is really important to being able to move people forward together. From uh, the private sector's perspective in, in banking, in particular Jordan, um, how can the private sector help with this? Knowing uh, there are going to be several folks, uh, maybe based on their experience, maybe uh, inability to get financing to, to own their own home. Um, how do we continue to build wealth with those individuals, you know, for family stability, neighborhood strength, uh, you know, from your private sector perspective? Yeah, I mean, building wealth obviously is, is I mean, it's the whole heart of economic prosperity. It's the way that um, everybody in our, all of our communities move forward. It's a, I think it's a basic right. I mean, most uh, families uh, and most immigrants just think that have moved here. And they started their wealth by having their own business. They had to find a way. They, they sold fruit on the corner. They sold watermelons. They, they did what they had to do uh, to be that entrepreneur. You know, they weren't not necessarily technical entrepreneurs. They didn't have technical skills or the kind of uh, skills, robotics, or any of those kind of fancy terms. They did stuff. They owned the corner store. You went to the corner store right here in Milo Grogan. I mean, up and down St. Clair, we had, we had a couple stores. And I go get a loaf of bread. Well, you we had to go, there was an owner at that store. And, it, and those stores are gone. Uh, down on Cleveland Avenue were multiple businesses up and down Cleveland Avenue, and even along Fifth Avenue. I think of the White Castle that was there. I think of the, um, <clears throat> the uh, Dairy Queen that was there on, on Fifth Avenue. And, but those basic businesses are the, f are the foundation of wealth access to jobs. I mean, but at the core of all this, uh, Mayor, I think it's a simple thing, it's education. I mean, it's, 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 it's finding the, the way to stabilize yourself uh, by getting some level of education and then taking advantage of the opportunities that you have. There, there are tons and tons of jobs in this community that we're not qualified for for whatever reason, so we need to get the training. We need to match those things up. That's where wealth comes from. It comes from working hard every day. I hate to use that such a simple phrase, but that's really what it is. There is no way to get there without a, a discipline and developing work habits and doing something every single day and making something out of your life. Wealth starts there, uh, savings start there, and, and uh, so, so while there are, I wish there were some magic umbrella that we could throw out to say, hey, if you just do these two things, that you're, you're going to be wealthy. That's just not the case. But you can, you can move through the society. There are opportunities right here in Columbus. And if you dig for them and you look for them, uh, you will find them. Laura, I want to talk a bit about, we've talked about the connection between mobility and prosperity mobility and uh, economic independence and security. So how does CODA play a role in the future of mobility? How do we go from being a bus company, which is important, we have tens of thousands of people that re rely on CODA every day to get to uh, their basic needs, their work, to healthcare, to, but how does uh, CODA of the 21st century become our mobility leader and a, you know, a, a partner that can help shape as we grow as dynamically and dramatically over the next 20 or 30 years as we did maybe in the last 75. You know, what's CODA's role in that, that, that future? Um, great question. And I think we have a lot of different roles um, in terms of first technology and how do we take a bus company and well, actually, as we say at CODA, it's really not a bus. It's actually a 40-foot mobile computer. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't even get in a bus and turn a key and go. There is no key <laughs> on a bus. You push a button and go. It has, um, it's collecting a ton of data. We also, though, have free Wi-Fi. Um, and, you know, if you go on any CODA bus line, C-Bus, the number five, the C-Max, I'm going to tell you, half of our passengers or more, it doesn't matter where they're from, are, have this, have the phone, they're looking at it, they're using it. And so Kona knew, you know, we need to provide that amenity at no cost for our passengers. I'm proud to say we are the third largest transit authority in the, or on, I'm sorry, one of only three transit authorities in the country offering free Wi-Fi. We're also make 
Wi-Fi available at our transit centers, like the new Northland Transit Center, the Linden Transit Center, we're committed to that. And soon there's going to be mobile payment. Um, and we're, with that, you know, we are committed to helping our community transition to that change. We think that that is going to be important change. We will also have um, a new card as well. So if you can't use your phone, there will be a card. And we work very closely with Smart Columbus. It's the future. Um, one of our CODA board members is here today, Michael Stevens, who, um, with this, leading the Smart Columbus project. And I think there are upwards of close to nine projects that CODA is directly working with. Um, we're working on mobility hubs because we know that transportation is multimodal. CODA can get you to some places, but it might make sense to then finish that trip with your bike um, or car to go. And we're also working on multimodal trip planning and many more opportunities too. I think finally, I just would like to call out um, a really game-changing effort that we have and that's the downtown sea pass program and coda is just thrilled to be a partner of that um, thanks to the downtown special improvement district capital crossroads cleve ricksecker his board um, public partners like the city of columbus morpsey and others have really made this possible there are is nothing quite like it in the country and actually it's gaining attention internationally and um, this program is going to lift a barrier a barrier for some people to come down to our region's biggest job center and get a job get a job in a hotel get a job in a restaurant get your first job at the third right <laughs> and so now um, with this commitment of our property owners business owners employers and um, others like the city of Columbus, they will not have to pay for parking and they will have access to a complimentary transit coda pass. So we're really excited. That's the future. Being bold, getting, having partners and trying some really innovative ideas. Well, uh, we may have set a record tonight for the number of questions we received. <laughs> so I'm going to start to transition us there. Uh, but Lisa, I think you wanted to, to add something and, and want to give you a chance before we get to that. Yeah, I, I wanted to talk uh, also, I, I mentioned that um, through funding, generous funding from the city of Columbus and Franklin County, uh, we actually, as I said, have our first place-based initiative here in Milo Grogan. Um, we, the board, the Ohio Means Job Center, are partnering with CareSource uh, to look at some other ways that we can get people quickly to at least into jobs and onto career paths. And actually, I'm excited tonight because we have Angela Thompson, who is one of the life coaches with CareSource. Angela, raise your hand. And we have Donald Love, who is sitting next to her. And he, you, you challenged us, Mayor, about uh, getting people into hospitality. Um, he has, he is currently in the culinary school and uh, he was already working in the, in the food uh, preparation. He's now in culinary school on his way to becoming a chef. And I asked him, when's he going to cook for me? And he said he would. So Don, could you just stand up and wave your hand? So so that, you know, we, we are um, really excited to be in neighborhoods, 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 neighborhoods. I've listened to you, Mayor. <laughs> um, and make sure that um, we're looking what we can do in the neighborhoods of the city and where we can provide services uh, more abundantly in addition to what we do at the Ohio Means Job Center. And this is an example of what we're, we're trying to do. So. I think the best person, and I'll, I'll I'll ask just one person to answer the question to try to get as many of these as we can. So a question from Maria Lee, and I'm going to, um, uh, you know, ask Leah to, to answer this one. Uh, how do we address the cost of living while participants are transitioning from low-paying jobs to better-paying jobs, child care, insurance, et cetera? Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, the benefits, Cliff, when we, we were focusing on the Women's Commission and Diversity and Inclusion at the King Center a week or two ago. But you want to talk a little bit about how Homeport and other uh, nonprofits in the committee help with that 
transition? Actually, um, there is some really innovative work going on with the Alliance for Affordable Housing in Central Ohio. And one of the tenets of that initiative is around this exact idea. It's acknowledging, we have to acknowledge first that, again, if you're working every day, living paycheck to paycheck, you cannot afford to take a pay cut to go to school potentially. So one of the tenets of that program is that we may be able to provide, um, the program would structure a rent subsidy for a temporary time that would fill that gap while someone was, big, was uh, increasing their skills, going back to school, getting some on-the-job training to be able to provide that security. So again, it, it, that's a leap to make for an individual to be able to leave what their current circumstance is to try to move into a better circumstance. And so I think some social supports from programs where there could be a rental subsidy or there could be a rental reduction during that time could be a way to fill that gap. We're just in into those conversations as we've just really recognized the need for that opportunity for mobility to be within a family but also at the same time maintain their housing stability so I think those are early conversations but it does get to the heart of some of the barriers for people to participate in these programs or pursue um, different job opportunities are how am I going to leave the security that I have now one of the things we do do at Homeport is in our rental properties and our multifamily properties we do provide out of school time programming why for that exact reason is that if you're worried about your kids or what they're doing or not doing then it's very hard for you to be present at your job um, and be consistent in your job and, and if your child care is that issue. So we do do out of school time programming that summer and after school you, through partners in the community, Boys and Girls Club being one of them, providing those services at our property. And if we could continue beyond Homeport and with other housing providers to provide those kind of supports so that low and moderate income families can make those, those leaps to the next step. This next uh, question, um Thank you, Leah. This next question is from uh, Daryl Hunter, and I'll probably ask Alex uh, and Jordan to respond to this. Uh, Daryl Hunter, I would love to hear about if and how the entities represented by the panel are working together, and also if what opportunities have already been identified for local businesses to come alongside those efforts. So maybe partnerships that Fifth Third and the Idea Foundry have uh, with uh, local uh, leaders and business owners and how you all partner. Sure. Um, yeah, well, I'd, I'd love to work with everyone here. And uh, we've heard a lot about the Columbus Way and even groups like ECDI who provide grants and education to uh, startups and to entrepreneurs. Um, was just chatting with Leah before we stepped up here. I'd love to see a residential component uh, to our space so that there might be a few houses where we can invite experts from around the world to be a maker in residence or an entrepreneur in residence to teach people um, in Columbus things that are cutting edge in other parts of the world. And um, uh, also workforce development. Uh, I know uh, Lisa, I'd love to put together a program where maybe before somebody commits to going to a two-year college to learn construction or welding or goes to a four-year college, uh, come kick the tires on a new career or new passion or new hobby for a day or for a week. I'd love to have uh, a one-week camp where you can learn 20 skills, 20 trades, 20 uh, different types of art within a week. I'm 40 something years old and only now do I know what I want to do uh, when I grow up. It would be great to do that for 15 year olds or 50 year olds or uh, 100 year olds. <laughs> so would love Taking more Taking you up on that. <laughs> please do, please do. <laughs> yeah, Alex mentioned a number of things. One of, one of the things we did at Fifth Third Bank, uh, so around 2008 when the uh, Great Recession hit, uh, we partnered with a company called Next Job. So Next Job, the idea with Next Job, we, we kind of started selfishly. We had a lot of folks that uh, were not able to make their home payments. We didn't really want their house back. We didn't want to foreclose on homes. Uh, but the reason they couldn't make their house payment was because uh, they had lost employment, you know, maybe through no fault of their own. Their company that they worked for was downsizing. So we worked with a company called Next Job. And Next Job, uh, what, what they do is they help with the workforce development. So you can go onto the site uh, and, and uh, it, it helps you to um, identify uh, the skills that you have and then helps you put together a resume and then helps you to find that next job So that was one of the things we did to partner with at, at the bank That's all we do every single thing we do is we help other people 
do the work that they're best capable of doing. We have home buyer education programs and things like that, but our best use of our assets in the bank is to really help and empower other people like we have great partnerships with, with a company like Homeport, for instance, nonprofits. Uh, you know, we help CODA with a lot of things. We're, uh, we do a lot of banking with them, but our, that's, that's our best use is to partner with the people that are best in the community to do the work, and then we can provide the funding. We can provide the uh, financial support. Can I just add really quickly? Please. And thank you, Jordan, because we have an active partnership. If a person, I think, asked for some of the examples of our current partnerships, Fifth Third has contributed to over $200,000 to owner occupy repairs here in the Milo Gogan neighborhood as a support for the neighborhood of realization work that Homeport is doing with the new home construction. Um, that's a very tangible, very present partnership that we have with them to Jordan's point that they they saw something that we were pursuing funding for that we had an area, a capacity in and could bring that to the neighborhood and they brought their funding to support that. And that goes to that issue of um, prosperity, asset building, being able to invest with existing residents at the same time that we're building new home opportunities is again providing that lift to the entire neighborhood. And thank you, Jordan. Uh, you're welcome, Leah. <laughs> so we've got, I think, about five minutes left here and lots of questions, some of which uh, I'm going to ask our staff to follow up on. There's specifically a question here from Esther about Amazon uh, and about income uh, uh, inequality and how tax incentives that might be realized by Amazon and other companies, what we're doing differently. I talked a little bit about that earlier, but I'm going to ask Director Shoney to follow up with Esther to get her some more specific and detailed information about how we're approaching that to make sure that we have lessons learned from Seattle and other places that, that, that have partnered with them. So one of the questions, uh, this is kind of a twofold back to Leah. Uh, I guess we got lots of questions of housing, and that must be <laughs> an issue, that in transit. So first of all, Pastor Mary Ellen uh, Crutcher uh, has a very specific question that, uh, uh, what's the process to become involved in, i.e., a candidate for housing? And then the twofer from Stephen uh, Dubuv, um, what is keeping Columbus from bridging the affordable housing gap? What have we learned from San Francisco, Denver, in other cities, um, and what practical steps can be taken to make sure Columbus has a different story 20 or 30 years from now? I know we've talked about that, but anything else you'd like to add to you know, for either Pastor or uh, Stephen's questions, Leah? So I'll answer the second one first. Um, what can we do differently? Act early. So we can act now, we can be commit now to resources and policies that support affordable housing so that 20 years from now, uh, next door to the Amazon where development has exploded, um, you still have housing that's affordable to the whole range of workers that work at a, an example like an Amazon. And what other cities, we are learning what other studies didn't do is that the, the market and the development got ahead of the policy making and the investment, the public investment of public dollars or private dollars towards this effort. And so now they're trying to make up for and trying to incentivize and really in a lot of communities, even where they're using um, policy making like inclusionary zoning, um, the, the developers are choosing to just pay into a fund versus creating those affordable units because the margins and the costs are such that they can't make those numbers work. So what we can do differently is, is have this kind of conversation and push forward opportunities for collaboration and partnership that create funding resources that are ongoing and that will support the development of a continued development of affordable housing. We can't depend on the federal government to do that. Um, we, can't, we have to look at regional solutions because our needs here are different than they are in other regions. And how do they get involved? They can call us if they want to know more about being a Homeport resident, please, uh, they can have our contact information and we can follow up. Up on that. Well, and another parallel question uh, from Miranda Martinez about uh, interest in the community uh, going from a land bank to a land trust community. And so I know uh, you probably can weigh in on that, but I want to make sure we get to some of these other questions. But Miranda, we have your question. We'll make sure that Leah and uh, the development department get back to you because those are conversations that are taking place right now in this committee. So it's a great idea and timely. Um, Question, and maybe this is uh, an opportunity uh, for anyone, uh, from Makita Matthews. Columbus is a diverse and is becoming more diverse, race, economic class, gender, et cetera. What is your challenge to all these Fortune 500 companies 
uh, in Columbus to reflect and increase the diversity within their workforces and their supply chains. I know we focused a lot about that uh, at the Women's Commission and the Diversity Inclusion session we had at the King Center, but Makita had that question and wanted to give any one of you an opportunity to talk about it. I'm, I'm happy to start because I think I answered it again. Everybody who can work needs to work. The explosion in Columbus, the number, of, the amount of growth we're going to see in both population and jobs and business means that um, any company who isn't um, trying to make sure that they are open to and supporting everybody who wants to work with them is going to lose. So if you are not an employer of choice for any of the populations we have, the diverse, the immigrants, our LGBTQT community, our, you know, all the diversity we have here, you are not going to be successful in the next 20 years. And at the Workforce Board, we're committed to not only doing the things we talked about, but also in, um, educating employers on good practices for hiring, maintaining, and retaining talent. And that includes that question. Um, final question, I will give uh, Laura a chance to talk. I, I have about five questions all about transit and transportation, but I think, uh, so I have questions here from uh, Dave George, uh, from Dan Welch, Thomas Metz, so we'll make sure to share those with you. Um, I think the biggest question is about change and disruption. Um, and everything from how CODA is preparing for the future uh, with respect to your employees, your drivers, what's this future of, mo of mobility look like and how is CODA preparing their staff, their workers of today for the future of mobility so they don't get left out um, when this, you know, uh, takes place and really reshapes the entire way we get around this community and around the country? It's a great question. I mean, no doubt transportation is um, in a kind of revolutionary transformation phase and is changing very, very quickly. And CODA has always been committed with a really strong training program for our employees. We have a great training facility um, housed right within our McKinley Avenue um, facility. But, you know, it's I think that it's also about working with other partners and um, to bring the best minds all together. And some of what we see in the future is, I guess first, we're not gonna get away from having buses. And in fact, if anything, we're going to need more high capacity transit. So I think when we sometimes envision that we're going to have a, you know, everyone will be in their own individual autonomous vehicles, it's just not possible when we're going to grow by a million people, 300,000 more jobs. So working with MORPSI um, on this regional corridor analysis, City of Columbus has some funding. I mean, we're looking at other corridors like what we did with CMAX on Cleveland Avenue to provide service that can move large groups of people. So we're going to continue to need bus operators who can manage that. But we're also going to need a lot of people with technical skills, you know, looking down at Lisa um, and looking at Alex thinking, gosh, you know, I think we should be talking because we probably, there's a way probably to manufacture 3D parts to fix our buses. Um, so it's a really exciting time to be in transit. And I just wrap up that we're looking for a young workforce too. We have piloted an apprentice, um, apprenticeship program with our in our maintenance and facility division. And it's a field that we do not have enough workers coming through. It's very critical. Um, and so I guess just any on that, you know, just like everyone else, the 33,000 open jobs, we're open, our doors open as well. Well, thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank all our panelists for uh, a great conversation tonight.
based on the amount of questions we got to and the ones we didn't, uh, this conversation could go on for a while, but we promised everybody 7.30 and we are there. So uh, I wanna thank you all. I wanna thank everyone who came and participated, folks who watched uh, uh, in person or online. Uh, and now uh, for our final benediction, uh, to wrap us up this evening, it's my pleasure to introduce Pastor Samuel Thomas Jr. from the Central Seven-Day Adventist Church. Pastor Thomas. I'm sure all of us will agree, especially those of us who are faith partners, that the value in this event allows us to become more informed of all of the services that prove that our community cares. More than that, I believe that tonight has proven that our mayor really cares. And I think we should put our hands together. Let's pray. Father Eternal, we're thankful that we have been together tonight. Grow our hearts with a sensitivity to you and to each other as we seek to serve you and this community for the betterment of all. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Thanks, everybody. This concludes our program. Thank you for attending the 2018 State of Our City Neighborhood Conversation.